Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Talking Dogs with Dante. Um, our usual time, our usual place. Uh, as I can see, people are watching again from all over the world. So it's not only good evening, it's also good morning and good afternoon to some of you. Um, always happy to see that there are so many people watching it live. Uh, we are coming close to 200 uh, people and a lot of comments already for our guests tonight. Uh, that also always makes me incredibly happy. Uh, before I, we start with the interview, of course, I always want to ask you, uh, make a photo uh, of, of your screen that you are watching it, put it in your Instagram story, tag me, so uh, I can share it later. It's always nice to share the interview during, the, during <coughs> our talk, so more people can join, and um, it always it makes me happy, so it's always uh, like a, a personal favor from all of you. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you are excited about my guest tonight. Uh, I can tell you that we have been, uh, how to say, <laughs> also very excited in the last 20 minutes trying to connect all the things that everything works well because we had some technical problem, but now it should all work perfectly um, and it's already 
more than 230 people watching so that that sounds great to me uh, of course if at any time during the uh, the interview you will have any questions for my guest you can just put it in the comment and i will be happy to read it uh, the sponsor of our interview tonight as you have seen is eukanuba and now it's the time to introduce Henrik Frickstrand from Sweden, owner of the famous Yumis Kennel. Good evening, Henrik. How are you? Good evening, Ante. I'm well, thank you. The weather in Sweden has been very good. The winter is gone and it's mostly muddy now and rain and water and muddy dogs. So it's not perfect, but it's okay. Well, but you have gun dogs and that should be something you should be used to. So imagine us, we have Schnauzers and Scotties and Lassas and Maltese. That's not fun in Mad Goldens. I think that's, that's still okay. Absolutely. There are gun dogs, so we're used to this. So it's not a problem at all. Yeah. Okay, Hendrik, you will be happy to know that uh, um, it's already now more than 250 people watching live. Uh, people are saying hello to you. Uh, I don't know, literally from all over the world. And I will try to catch on some on some of the comments. And it's going to be quite difficult because um, we are now in eight minutes of our interview and we have already 40 comments. But uh, for the moment, it's only people um, uh, saying hello. For example, Kinga is saying, woohoo, can't wait. I know we all, uh, all can learn a lot from Hendrik. Good luck. Um, Catherine is saying, let me see. Erin Derry Golden Retrievers is watching. Uh, let me see people watching from Canada, from Iceland. Anna Weber saying so much looking forward to this interview. Uh, Natasha watching from Malta. Kinga watching from California. Uh, Cecilia from Romania. Uh, um, from England. Uh, uh, Andrew Brace, of course, is here. Suzanne Karlstrom saying so looking forward to this, have fun Ant and Hendrik. So uh, Sandra from Germany, people literally from all over the world are watching and I'm really happy uh, to have you tonight with me. Um, Hendrik, first what I want to ask you is uh, the question that I ask to everyone. Uh, what was your last dog show as an exhibitor or, or as a judge? And what are you hoping to be the first show for you this year? Okay. Well, first of all, Ante, I would like to say that I'm really delighted and I feel so privileged and honored to be on your talk tonight. I feel really humble about that. So thank you so much. Thank so, you for uh, accepting. Well, to answer your question, the last show, um, I was judging the big Stockholm show in December 2019 and I did the Gando Group and put up a fantastic American Cocker Spaniel. He won the group and later he became the top dog of the year. That's, that's the last show I've been to, actually. <laughs> so you and didn't go anywhere in 2020, in 2020? No, no, we didn't have any shows in Sweden at all. Some of the oh other God. Canadian countries, they had shows, but we had nothing here at all. So, you know, we have lots of young dogs and they haven't been shown, which is a pity, but that's how it goes. Yeah. So about and, the show, and, the show yes. scene in Sweden, we really don't know what's going to happen. I, I know that everything is cancelled uh, until June anyway. So maybe July, depending what happens with this horrible pandemic. We will see. Yeah. And, and uh, how it's going in Sweden with the vaccinations? Are there, are there many people already vaccinated or not yet? Unfortunately not. I think it's going to take quite some time. They say that uh, everybody over 18 years should be vaccinated before midsummer, which is June, but without that, it, it seems it takes a lot of time. We're not as efficient as in the UK or in Israel, for instance. So we yeah. don't know. So it's a bit hopeless situation. Well, yeah, and, and, and then the last question about this, when you get the chance, are you going to vaccinate yourself or not? Yes, I am. Okay, Absolutely. good. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, first, I want to start because uh, you have sent me your CV and I have found a lot of interesting information there. And then I have watched other things and, and so on. I have tried to find out, to dig a little bit uh, about you. But um, before we start with this, uh, let's say, uh, 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 affairs of your love affairs of you and the Golden Retrievers, 
let's start about uh, your childhood. How did you get in the in the world of dogs? Was it your family who had dogs? Uh, why did you decide to have dogs? What was your first dog? A little bit about Henrik as a, as a small baby. <laughs> Henrik as a small baby. Well, yes. Uh, well, I can tell you, I come from a non-doggy family. But having said that, we actually, well, my parents actually had a wild duck town when I was a toddler. But it turned out I was so allergic, so we couldn't keep this dog, um, which was, of course, was a pity because I really liked the dog. And then as I grew slightly older, not being able to have a dog, I, I took all the neighbor's dogs out walking. And it was especially, well, I guess that lots of young kids do that, you know, take neighbor's dogs out for walking. But it was particularly one neighbor. They had one golden retriever and two Welsh spring spaniels. And I went there almost every day after school and took them out and I groomed them outside, of course. Um, but, but I couldn't have a dog because of, of my allergy. So I had to have a sort of a sensibilization treatment for five years. So I did that. And, uh, but I really wanted a golden, not only because of my neighbor's dog, but also because I read Edith Blyton's books, The Famous Five. And the dog in the book is a golden retriever, and the dog in the book is called Tim. And today I have okay. a male called Timmy. So it huh? really summons up about 60 years, something like that. So that was the start. Um, and after this sensibilization treatment, I remember my mother took me to see one of the pioneer kennels. This is in the late 60s. And we went there, and of course, I thought this was very, very exciting. I wasn't even a teenager at the time. And we talked to the breeder, a very nice person. And she said, yes, that's okay if you want to have a bitch puppy, but the waiting list is two years. And two years okay. on a waiting list, I mean, when you're 10 or 12 years old, I mean, that's sort of a lifetime. Yes. So I, was, I was very, very disappointed, of course, about that. As a child, I mean, what can you do? Anyway, um, this breeder phoned my mother about six months later and said she had a puppy for us. And I was, of course, jumping for joy, thinking, wow, this is fantastic. And then my mother turned to me and said, well, she has a puppy for you, but it's black. Uh, <laughs> okay. A black gold retriever, well, that's no good. And that, of course, turned out to be a flat coat. Because the flat okay. coat, they were not very popular at that time, and it was difficult to sell. So I said, no, 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 I want a golden, golden retriever. And so the puppy, I had to wait till 1968. And then we, we found uh, a puppy, a pet from a pet breeder, but a nice bitch. She was really lovely, sweet, loyal. I had lots of fun with her. But uh, as it turned out, she had extremely bad hips and she wasn't very good looking. And I was started to be a little bit interested in dog shows. So I realized this is not going to be the future. And um, I remember in 69, I worked as a kennel boy for a short time at one of the gold retriever kennels in Sweden. That was with um, Ylva Browniel. She had the prefix of Sandemar, very famous. And she started in gold in 1958. I worked with her and she learned me a lot of things, which was great. Um, yeah, what happened? Yeah, of course, I had to wait to have another dog because my parents were not that happy to have another dog. But I managed to convince my mother and she convinced my daddy that I could have two puppies and they were both, both born uh, 71. And that was, okay. of course, fantastic for me to have two puppies at the same time with only six weeks in between them. And they were closely related from uh, the Camrose and Bria and stubble down breeding, very famous English kennels. And the stubble down, they were also dual purpose dogs. So that was the beginning. So these two bitches, they are my two foundation bitches. That's, that's so how that, it's you, you will be happy to hear that uh, most of my guests who are now famous in breeding, they all started with bad dogs. Well, not all, but like 90% or bed bite or no testicles or whatever. So I think that's, that's, that's uh, actually, I'm starting to think that's a key to success. 
everybody who started with the first dog, which was not a top show dog, became a famous breeder later on. So I think I think that's something that um, may, maybe that's that's the. I think that you know if you would have get first dog immediately a superstar, you would maybe not try so much like this. You really want to improve it. Happened. I, I was the same in that way. And and uh, we have an interesting comment uh, uh, while you were talking from Yasmina. She says, "Oh, imagine you would have gotten that flat coated. I'm sure you missed flat coats would be gorgeous." So <laughs> look. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you never yeah. know about that. Yeah. But I, I, was now, quite, I was quite determined I wanted a golden retriever. Because I, I now, thought it was... Yes. So now, that's, that's, all, now all the flat-coated retriever breeders in the world are saying, yes, yes, he didn't take the flat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. But, um, well, yeah. that's, that's... Okay. That's, it will make their life a little bit more difficult, but that's always fine. I'm just, I'm just joking, of course. Tell me, tell me, Henrik, do you remember your first dog show? Yes, of course. Well, the first dog show at, at Spectator was 1965. I went to the big Stockholm show we had in, in December every year. And in those days, it was in November, if I remember correctly. And going there with my, my mother, it was fantastic. Uh, but it took some years before I went with my first dog, the pet golden. I had 68. She was shown 69. I actually showed her about 10 times. Always end of the line with a very good or a good. So I did realize she, this is not something for the future. Yeah. Uh, well, and then when I had the other two girls uh, that were born in, in 71, uh, one of these two bitches was called a Ports Angelique, and she was from the Pioneer Breeder I visited in the mid 60s. And when she went to the first dog show, she won the CC, the CLC, as a junior. So I was That's nice. high, high, thinking, wow, this is fantastic. The other girl I had uh, in 71 was called Dainty's Bachelor Girl, and she actually also got the CC, the CLC, on her first show. So the start was fantastic, and I was very lucky about that. They were both good-looking, super temperament, and good hips. We didn't do elbows or eyes. I mean, they were okay, but we didn't do anything else in those days. So I, I was happy yeah. with that. So, absolutely. Yeah. Tell me, tell me, um, your your kennel name is you missed, Where did the kennel name come from? Yeah, that's a funny story actually, because uh, I was. Uh, driving in north of England, in Yorkshire, going to one of the Scottish shows, um, beginning of the 70s, I think 73, 74, with one of my best friends in, in the UK. This was, uh, well, I will talk about her later, Mrs. Hazel Hinks of Style Kennel. We were driving up there and we were discussing what sort of prefix I was going to have, and I wasn't sure about that. It was very early in the morning. It was dew outside and it was very misty. So she said, well, why don't you take dew mist? Uh, you know, dew, dew is very, it's misty outside and there's also dew. So that's how it became, dew mist. That's, oh, that's, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, that's quite, I, I thought that was quite good. And actually the Golden Retrieve's inheritance is from Scotland where this sort of weather, you know, you, so that was really good. I was happy about that. Yeah, and because was, it, sounds re was, it sounds really good. Thank you. Yeah, and I was happy yeah. that SCI. Uh, approved on the name that it wasn't taken before. Yeah, uh, I need to tell you, um, you know, uh, that there are some things happening behind your back at the moment. Uh, Suzanne Carlson is trying to persuade Short to take a flat coated retriever, so they are discussing a little bit. Uh, Short seems to be very uh, sure that he doesn't want a flat coated at home, but I don't. I will tell you how the story will finish at the end. Anyhow, <laughs> um, I know that. Well, you you said you said now, like from the from the beginning, uh, from your um, early age, you were determined to have the the, the golden. Uh, during this pe period, during all these years, have you been involved uh, in any other breed, or it was always goldens? Always golden. Very, and you never wanted perfect. anything else. Yes, I have been tempted to have. I've been looking at some other breeds, but I always felt, no, I think I would stick to my Golands. <laughs> I, was, okay, I was quite interested. I mean, the flat coats has been very close to my heart. 
as the Welsh Springer and the Field Spaniel. Then the, nowadays we have Irish Setters as well. Yeah, yeah. Tell me, uh, your first your first um, uh, litter was born <clears throat> in 1973. Um, was it from one of the two girls that you took? And, and tell us a little bit the story about the first litter. Was it already the first Yumi's litter? I suppose yes. 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 Um, it was the puppies were born in July. I had only two bitch puppies. And I needed a vet to help me with a, with the well-being because the puppies were stuck. But the vet managed to pull the two bitches out without a C-section. So that was perfect. And I used a, a Swedish dog that uh, was quite in fashion at the time. He was quite young, but I really loved him. And he was half English bred. And he went back to the Camrose line that I mentioned was behind my two bitches. So it was line breeding to Camrose. And Camrose was one of the greatest kennels in the UK, owned by Mrs. Joan Tudor and later joined with, uh, by Rosemary Wilcox. So that was the start. And uh, I kept a bitch puppy from that litter. So that was the start from one of the girls. And I kept on breeding from that, of course. And now I am 14 generations further down the track. The other, the other girl had a litter the year after. And then I used an English import called Davin Fergus, who was also Camrose breeding. So that is the other line. So that's what I stuck to all the time, this sort of type, the Camrose background. Okay, wonderful. Um, I want to ask you now, uh, um, if, if you would, uh, for example, now go for a dinner with somebody who says to you, Henrik, I would like to, to become a judge for golden retrievers. Can you tell me what are the most important characteristics of the breed? What makes a golden good golden? What would you point out as the, as the as, let's say, the most important characteristics characteristic for the correct breed type? Well, first of all, a gold retriever is a biddable, loyal, lovely, happy, confident dog. Well, always a wagging tail, the most beautiful head, well, in my mind, of course, beautiful head, soft expression, um, just friendly, lovely. It's a short, compact dog with a level top line, good angulations, they move really well. For me, it's wonderful to see the whole range of color because the standard says any shade of gold or cream, but not red or mahogany. So in the rings, we all see blonde dogs and darker dogs. And I think that is lovely to see the whole range. This is uh, what I wanted, actually, actually, sorry I, to interrupt you. Uh, this is, uh, that was my next question and, and I, I can touch it now when you are talking about this. I have heard few times um, exhibitors and, and, and judges commenting, oh, this dog is too dark, this dog is too, um, too light. Uh, so it is actually all, all shades of golden. Yes. Well, you know, Anta, this is a question I've heard for so, so many years. Um, other judges, colleagues uh, saying to me, well, of course, you, you're in the breed. You, must, you can tell me, why are there so many white gold retrievers? And I said, well, I've been in this breed for about 50 years. I've never seen a white gold retriever. And if you compare it to a white shirt, they are not white. The standard says any shade of gold cream. Full stop. That's how it is. Everything is allowed. There are no white gold retrievers, and I've never seen a red gold retriever. I remember I judged um, in Nova Scotia, the, the, the national in Canada, about five, six, seven years ago, and it was an extremely dark bitch, extremely dark bitch, walking uh, at the, uh, around the ring, and I was thinking, oh, I wonder if she's coming into my ring. And she did, and she was absolutely on the limit of darkness. But she won because she was the best. So for me, color is not important at all. Okay, that, that, that's nice to hear because I, I, I have heard during the years, um, um, you know, people commenting, this is too light, this is too dark, and then I, I you know, I wanted to ask you what, what is the, what it is that you, and then another thing what I want to ask you, 
uh, when you were talking about uh, correct type, um, in your opinion, the first uh, words that you mentioned were about the temperament. Um, I must say that, unfortunately, in the last, let's say, 10, 15 years, probably because of the fact that the breed started to be so popular, there have been many times that I have seen aggressive golden retrievers at the shows. Uh, where, where did that come from? Okay, well, that's sad to hear because I haven't experienced that. Uh, aggressive dogs, no, but I've seen dogs with soft temperaments. Um, a little bit shy, um, but not aggressive. No, that's uh, we we had some aggressive well, dogs <laughs> if you go back to the seventies, but that was before you were born. But uh, <laughs> but in, 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 when I started judging, I don't think I ever seen an aggressive dog. Maybe 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 once or twice. But if there's something, if I can see an issue with the temperament, they are in that case a little bit soft, a little bit apprehensive. But not aggressive. I, I'm sorry to hear that you have well, experienced that. Well, that's, that's, that's Henrik because you live in a nice, civilized country where people are shy and sensible. And we live in Balkans where people are very loud and aggressive. So probably it's connected to that part, I suppose. I don't know what would be the other explanation. But, okay. <laughs> no, I, there, obviously there has not been many cases like this. But I have seen it times. And I think it's probably, you know, with these countries uh, where there are a lot of puppy millers, you know, at the time when the breed became uh, became uh, very popular, probably that's that's the problem. And that's where where it did it come from. But uh, yeah. it was not something that I would say that it's now uh, common to see. Uh, no, you, you, of course, I mean, the temperament, uh, I, I think generally the temperament is lovely. But of course, some of these uh, worried dogs, some are a little bit, can be a bit afraid. Maybe it can turn over to be a little bit aggressive. I don't know. Of course it could be. Um, but I've judged many times in Europe, all over, and uh, I can't remember really I've seen any of this, but of course it happens. And it's not only the yeah. dog. I mean, it's also the owner of the dog. How does people treat the dog? Yes, like it was. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. Um, you, you have judged the breed all, all around the world. And uh, this is one of these breeds that is, um, <laughs> let's say, not fortunate uh, with the fact that it looks the same everywhere in the world. There are definitely di differences in type between UK, Europe and the USA and so on. Uh, but obviously the breed carries the same name everywhere. Um, can you tell us a little bit what are the main differences between the UK or let's say European type and the American type? And, and um, do you think that at some point, if the differences are really big, the breed should be changed? Like I have been asking my guests, should it be American Springer Spaniel and English Springer Spaniel? Should it be the same with the Goldens or you don't think so? No, 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 no. Don't change the name. No, no. It's the Golden Retriever, definitely, for sure. But, I mean, uh, I've been lucky enough to, to judge a few times in the U.S and also in Canada, but if we concentrate on the US in America, they have a slightly different standard to what we have. And the AKC standard describes the dog in a little bit different way. Uh, so what is the difference? Well, the American dogs are slightly bigger. Um, the head shape is explained in a different way. Uh, they emphasize on pigment. They must have the pigment, which it doesn't say in the, in the English standard at all. The color, the blonde dogs are not accepted. But when we say blonde, what we say light cream is not accepted in the standard. So that is a bit difficult. And then I would say it's the grooming, because we groom the dogs in a different way than in the U.S. And also this, the, the standard says that they should have a natural rough, and that uh, the, the natural appearance shouldn't be altered by cutting or clipping. So that is different. And then, of course, it's the handling. They handle the dogs in a different way. Um, but if, if you compare the standard, it's not that much difference. It's more the sort of fashion, grooming, handling. Um, 
I, I did a seminar a few years ago in, in Nova Scotia where I find this, found this very, very dark beach, where I compared the standards from uh, America, Canada, Europe and Australia. And I had photos showing the difference. And that was quite interesting to see for everybody that it isn't that much difference, but they look different. This is uh, uh, this is this is what what we were talking. I don't I don't remember. Maybe it was Annika or somebody. I don't I don't remember. Um, somebody was saying that actually the same with the English Springer Spaniels. When you compare the the FCI standard with the American standard, actually the standard is not so different, but the dogs look completely different. Yes, yes, yes. They they look different in America, but there are many many dogs in the US, in America, that could win in Europe, if they're groomed and handled our way. I, I'm quite sure of that. And um... Okay, when you say that, when you say that, uh, would you ever, let's say, put an, um, an American bloodline into your line or not? I tried once, uh, but unfortunately, I only had one puppy, and that's about 10 years ago. Um, but it was only one puppy, so I couldn't evaluate what I got from it because that puppy wasn't outstanding by any means. But I know that there are there are breeders. Um, I'm thinking of especially one breeder in Italy. Uh, the prefix is Royal Crest, and this this is an American lady moving to to Italy, and she brought some American bloodline compared com combined with the best of the English bloodline. And it works really, really well. But maybe it will take one generation or two generations. But uh, I haven't yeah. tried yet. I'm a little bit tempted maybe once more to try. But I, I only okay. did it once. Okay, that, that, that sounds interesting. So we will follow, follow if that will happen and, and when. Uh, Desi Murphy is writing. He says many of the American dogs are low on legs. Did you notice the same? Yes. Yeah, some of them are a bit low on leg, and they have tons of bone, which we don't have, but they're also prepared in a different way. I mean, the coat is blown up, so they look really like you found them. But yeah. we, we, can, we can have that here as well. And I, I found that some of the American dogs carry the tail quite high, and yeah. we are not so yeah. fond of that here. Yeah. Um, if we go back, um, Hendrik, to, to your start, let's say to your first uh, two beaches that you got um, and we compared them to the goldens of today your goldens or goldens from other people would you say that in this period of let's say we are talking about 73 so it is i'm so bad in mathematics let's say 50 years do you think that the breed has changed a lot during these 50 years do you think it has changed for better or you think it has changed for worse do you think in general my question is are the dogs from the past better than the dogs of today? No, 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 no. The dogs are much better now. Dogs from, from those days, they could not win today, absolutely not. Today, I feel we have, in general, more bone, more angles, more substance, better head. Um, no, no, the, the dogs from the 70s, maybe a handful could win today, but generally not. So the, the breed has really improved over the years because we've had so many excellent breeders, uh, especially, of course, in, in the UK, the origin of the gold retrievers. That's where you can find the depth of the quality. And it's always been like that. They have the depth of the quality. And if you're talking about Sweden or Scandinavia, there's been so many dedicated breeders here that really devoted their life to the gold retrievers. So we, we have a solid quality here, I think. Over the years, I'm, I must tell you, it's been a sort of a funny story because sometimes we, we compete with Norway. Because in a few years, Norway has the best golden, and maybe three years later, Sweden has the best golden. That's how it's been for years. But generally in Scandinavia, the quality is really good. Yeah, but that's, that's, that's great because uh, in many breeds, when I ask this question, people sometimes say um, we think that we should go in the past with some of the things, not with all, obviously. But, um, you know, people would say, OK, I, we think some some things that were good in the past were lost. So I'm happy to say to hear that you say that Goldens are not one of these breeds. Uh, we have a question here and I will try 
um, try to 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 connect uh, to these questions. But uh, as many comments are coming, Hendrik, because there are 324 people watching it live, and we ho got 125 comments till now, so it's not easy to follow them all. Uh, all right. uh, I will I will I will talk talk um, uh, with you later on, obviously about breeding. But let's try to remember uh, the question from Rini Linen, who is asking, what do you think about the outcross breeding the Kennel Club prefer at the moment? Just remember it. Maybe you want to mention it la later when we are talking uh, about breeding. And then um, uh, Mikhail Axenborg is saying, Hendrik and Bitte had a funny flight trip many years ago. You can ask if Hendrik remembers. Yes, I remember. Shall we talk about well, it now or later? How you want? Do you want to keep later. it for later? Later. Can, okay. I think it's maybe one of the photos, isn't it? I don't know. I I didn't. I yeah. I didn't yeah. look it. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. I, so I will, we talk I will about remember. it. Later. I will remember. Okay. And also the about reading. I will remember. Okay. Um, and then, okay, let's let's ask one of these questions more from the viewers. Frank is asking, what is Hendrik's opinion? About hind, uh, hind angulations now nowadays. Hind angulation is good. In some cases, they are overangulated, and the standard doesn't ask for an overangulated gold retriever. Absolutely not. And in my opinion, for whatever that is worth, um, some are a bit short on the leg, a bit long in body, a bit overangulated in the rear. And it gives them a sort of funny movement as well. Yeah. So well, but not not everybody, of course. But you can see that. Obvious. Yeah. Uh, I'll be connected a little bit with that question. My next question was um, because you have judged the breed um, all around the world. Um, if you would need to say, what do you feel that at the moment is the biggest problem of the breed? What would you say it is? Um, well. Maybe, as I wanted to say, is that you can see a bit short on the leg, could be a bit long in body, overangulated, which means you lose the balance. And sometimes the heads have been a bit strange, not the, the beautifully chiseled head the, the standard is asking for. Um, so I think that is something, it, it goes in different circles. Some, some years, maybe the angulation is too much, a few years later, maybe they're a bit short on the leg, and, um, and so it's changing. Yeah, it is. And if you read the standard, you, you will see that the standard is, is quite open. It's not a very strict standard at all. So, so maybe the standard could be a little bit more specific about the balance, because you, I always go for balance. I don't want anything extreme. The standard doesn't say for extreme long neck. Plenty of angulation. Uh, just it's it's a, it's, a, it's a quite an okay standard. Yeah, the, the, I I don't know. It's it's like uh, the people will start to think that you were the, the first of my guests to which I have sent the questions in advance because I manage always to connect connect my next question to something that you said now. But actually, my next question was if you could, if somebody would give you the possibility to change something in the FCI standard of the breed. Would you change something? And if yes, what? No, I, I don't think I would change anything, but maybe have the left standard a little bit less open. Because, I mean, as, because some, some stand, breed standards, as you very well know, and they are very specific with measurements and everything. The Golden Retriever standard is more open, so it gives a bigger room for interpretation. Which is, which is fine in, in one way, but maybe it could be a little bit more specific. And we, we must never forget the balance that is so important in my mind. Yeah. Uh, OK, uh, you have mentioned uh, that in the past there have been some um, problems with the, with the hips. Uh, how is the situation today with the breed? Are the Goldens healthy breed? Uh, what kind of tests do you do for your dogs? In general, what, what do you feel about the health status of the breed? The health status today is, is good. Um, as lots of the big breeds, we have problems with hip dysplasia. 
but we have x-rayed the hips since the 60s, I think, or maybe before, but at least from the 60s in, in the UK. And also we check the elbows for OCD, and we have cataracts in the breed, and we have PRA. But cataract and PRA, we don't see very often, but it's, it's there. So what we yeah. do as a breeder, we, we check the puppies when they're one year, the hips, eyes, and hopefully also the, the, the elbows. And in some countries, we are very good at this. For instance, Scandinavia, because we, we would like our puppy buyers to check the hips and the elbows when they are one year. And all, every, all dogs that are being used for, for breeding or, or stud work are also checked for eyes. So that's, that's, that's the main thing we have, so it's hips, elbows, and the eyes, that's what And the eyes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Then, of that, course, that's... We, have, we have something new uh, for the, some years, is it 10 years maybe, ICT, ichthyosis, which is a sort of a flake that some breed has. Uh, and and, America, and, and uh, I think that is just a cosmetic thing because it doesn't itch. And sometimes you can get it much better if you give them uh, uh, fish, I mean, uh, salmon oil, omega-3, omega-6. So, so ICT is a problem for, for some breeders. Some countries is very hyped up on that. For me, it's nothing. Uh, for me, it's just a cosmetic thing. And, and uh, also like some breeds, we, we have cancer. It's not very common, but it exists. I've heard that it's more frequent in America. Uh, but we are quite fortunate here not to have so much cancer, but it can happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in general, it is a healthy breed, and I mean, they live quite long. Oh yes, um, I just lost one dog a few months ago, and he was fifteen and a half years. And yeah. the oldest girl I had, she was sixteen years. That's but great for a big breed. Normally, uh, normally, I would say the lifespan is. 12 to 14 years, something yeah, like that's, that. That's, yeah, that's nice for a big breed. Um, yeah. Okay, um, there is one question that you have been already uh, commenting a little bit um, uh, uh, on that, but um, okay, let's, let's say once again, uh, Nicolas Jolly Rodriguez is asking, what is Hendrik's opinion about the temperament? Because a lot of Goldens are now very shy and it's not typical for the breed. You have mentioned it already before, but we can maybe emphasize it once again. Yeah. Well, it's not something we want. It's some, something we see sometimes, and it shouldn't be like that, because the Golem is a friendly, open-minded, happy dog that loves everybody and everything. They're not as robust like a Labrador, for instance, or not as sometimes overexcited like the flat coats. It's a normal, happy breed, waggy tail, and they should be loved and loved by everybody. But yes, sometimes, as I mentioned before, we can see some that are a bit soft and sometimes a little bit shy. I don't think it's a huge problem, but it, we can see it, yes, and I don't like it. And of course, yeah. and sometimes if you see dogs that you realize later on are from big kennels, maybe they are a little bit, you know, kennel, uh, well, you know. What yeah, I mean. not socialized enough, yes. No, exactly. Yeah, and and uh, uh, as as a judge, when you get the golden, which is a uh, let's say shy or something, how do you how do you deal with it? You you put it a grade down, or or how do you how do you work with that when you when you are judging the breed? Mm. Yes, normally I do that. If if the dog should have an excellence, and if the dog is shy and doesn't want to be, I can touch the dog, but uh, it's not very very happy. It gets very good. But then, of yeah. course, if I can't touch the dog, if I can't handle the dog at all, it's bye-bye, out. Yeah, that's yeah. okay. Yeah. I remember yeah. I had, uh, I was judging in Italy many years ago, and um, um, I had in, in open bitch, I had a lovely lineup. I had about 20 bitches, I think. And the, the, the last that was in the end, that bitch looked fantastic when I saw the, all, the, all the girls coming in. And when they all were moving around, they were fabulous. And I was thinking, wow, the last one, that is going to be my winner. 
But then when I went over this bitch, she completely freaked out. Not a chance. Mm. So out. Yeah. I don't put up stupid temperaments. No, no, never. Yeah. 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 But I, I think that that sometimes um, the, this is why I ask you because I think that that sometimes in some kind of breeds and and uh, goldens are one one breed like that. Maybe people, not people, judges are sometimes um, soft toward that kind of problem. And I think maybe in in the way you know that then comes more and more often because people think this is okay and it change. I mean, at some point maybe it can change the breed breed temperament and it should not be like that. So. It should be penalized no. strictly. Yeah. Yes, yes. I oh, know it's not something we want in the breed at all. So now they have to be penalized. Yeah. Uh, okay. Zelka Halper has obviously joined late because she's asking what about color golden retriever? Is it red, white, or golden? But Zelka, when you have time later on, just uh, check it from the beginning. We have been um, we have been talking about that. Um, but let's let's just talk for a second more about the color, because there is a question from Andrew Brace. He says, "I totally understand Henrik's explanation of the variation in shades of the golden color. However, as a breeder, does he con uh, consciously take into consideration the color of potential parents to avoid producing the extreme?" No, no, no. I, I never choose the dog of color. I have used dark goldens and I use the blonde dogs. Normally my, my dogs are quite blonde because that's, the, it's the, I mean, the, the type is not the color. The type in my mind is the overall picture, the temperament, the head, the expression, the balance. That's for me the type. Color doesn't matter. <clears throat> I had a, a, quite a dog which she is now 11 years and she, she was quite dark and she did a lot of winning and a lot of people said, oh, yeah, I have a really dark bitch. And she looks so different. I said, yeah, the, col the color is different. But if she was blonde, she would be exactly like the others. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't choose star dogs or anything because of color. And, and for the other question you just had a minute ago, just read the standard. Any shade of gold or cream, it's very simple. Not red or mahogany. It says all. And there are no yeah. white gold receivers. Yeah. It seems that this is obviously an interesting question for people about these colors. Uh, I was, you know, I, I heard a few times about it, but I didn't think that it is so much. Uh, but obviously, there are a lot of people who are who are interested about that because uh, maybe they interpret it in a different way. Anyhow, um, uh, there is a question also from a Croatian breeder Diana, but don't worry, Diana, I'm going to ask about that a little bit later. And then there is a question also from Manita. Um, about uh, about breeding and we are going to talk about that later so just stay with us i'm happy to to see that it's 320 people watching and a lot of questions coming so just uh, just keep them coming uh, Hendrik, let's do now some quick questions which are usually difficult for my guests uh, so let's 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 see how you will deal with that um which show you judged Till now, you consider to be the highlight of your judging career. Well, this is a little bit tricky question because I have been fortunate enough to judge some wonderful shows in many places. Um, top of the list must be Cross. I, I was very honored to be invited to judge Cross. This is now 10 years ago, and I did bitches. Um, it was a super quality, a fantastic day. I, I really loved every second. And uh, my co-judge was Pat Tuck of the Tamsbrook Channel. She did the main. Uh, and our best of breed, which was her dog, he's called Linegor McTavish. He was best of breed and he was third in the group and he looked lovely in the group. And my bitch, best bitch was Xanthos Zebedas Dallas. And she later was made up. So that must be the top of the list. But okay, coming, wonderful. Coming yeah. close, coming close, if I may add that, is yes. the, the US national in Colorado 11 years ago. That was a super, super day. I mean, one of the highlights of my judging career. I, I did the, the championship class. 
Yeah. Let me just ask you, because I think that's, that's interesting when we talk about this breed. Um, what, what was the entry of, of uh, Golden Retriever Beaches at Crafts and what was the entry um, for the U.S. National when you have judged? Well, the Golden and the Labradors are mostly competing to be the top breed at Crafts. So it's normally around four or four or five, 450, can be 500. I think when I judged it was about 400, which is a fantastic entry. The U.S. National, they had about a thousand golden retrievers, one thousand, and they are judged Amazing. over three, four days. And uh, I was lucky enough to judge the champion class, and that contained 151 champions all coming in at the same time. So that really Amazing. gave goosebumps all over. Yeah. That was a fantastic movement. And they were all presented and groomed to perfection and handled. Wow, a fantastic yeah. day. And my best to breed, best in show was a super, super dog. dog and he was called Rashil Ramelok of Abelard. And uh, he continued to do a lot of winning. Beautiful dog. Yeah. Uh, well, let's, let's just go away from my quick questions for, uh, for one second. Um, uh, maybe you can answer to, to one question from from um, our viewers which I think it's interesting and I'm, I I didn't mention it before uh, it's from Anne Tove Strand she's asking you what about presentation I have seen quite a few dogs which are scissored too much how do you comment on it yes very good question um, a golden should be groomed but you shouldn't see that it's groomed or trimmed. Some, some breeders, some exhibitors trim them too hard that you see all the scissor marks are sort of shaved on the neck, down the throat, uh, and I don't like that. I usually comment that in my critiques when I'm judging. Overgroomed, over scissored, I don't like it. Uh, I'm not a fond of the American way or the national rough either, but that is their standard. But if you concentrate on Europe and, and, and Australia, it's, it's more normal grooming, but they shouldn't be shaved. Okay. I, think I, I comment that in my critiques. Okay. Uh, there is an interesting question also from Joao Vasco Pocas, but we are going to, I'm going to ask you that a little bit later when we will talk about judging. Uh, let's continue now with the, with the quick questions. Uh, okay. favorite, golden of, favorite golden of all times, not bred or owned by you? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, right. Well, I think it has to be a golden from the 70s. And this okay. is a female called Style Susila. She was born 1973. And the breeder, uh, Mrs. Hazel Hinks of the Style prefix I mentioned her before, um, she has been sort of my mentor and my second mother. And she was a fantastic lady, and she never had a big kennel, never more than four or five bitches. She never owned a star dog. And uh, <clears throat> this female, Style Cecilia, she was beautiful. She was by the illustrious Camrose Cabus Christopher, and the mother was called Style Sibella. And she had a little sister that had the record for bitches for a long, long, long time, and that was Style Stephanie of Camrose, who had 27 cc. I think Susila had about 11 cc. And if I remember correctly, she won her last reserve cc when she was 10 or 11 years. I, I, I believe she is the one that I really, really love. But there's been many, but she's yeah, one yeah, that, of course. in my mind. Yeah, that comes to your mind. Okay, and now yeah. this is going to be even more, more, uh, more difficult to answer for you. Uh, and and the, when I ask this question, um, many, many of the breeders uh, who have bred many famous dogs like yourself uh, start, you know, to explain like, well, you cannot ask a mother which one is her favorite child. But if you would need to say which one is the best dog you ever bred, what you would say? Yeah, you have a lot of tricky questions, Anta. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you were, if you were on Facebook and if you were watching. Uh, my interviews before, maybe some of them you would know, but I prefer it this way that that I make your life difficult. I like that. 
Okay, the best golden I have bred. Yes, okay. You miss silk screen. You miss okay. silk screen. Uh, um, lived in Budapest in Hungary. And he was sold to a wonderful family, but always handled by Zolt Hanu. And he was campaigned all over Europe, and he's one of all time top dogs in, in Europe in Golden. He won groups at the World Show and Euro Shows, and he started winning as a junior, I think, in Tuln. And his last show was at the World Show in Milan in 2015. He was best to breed, he was 11 years. And he yeah. was best Western in show, and if I remember correctly, he was also third in the group. So yeah. I reckon that is probably the best dog I have ever bred. And in, 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 in female, um, I think it has to be Dumis Duplicity. Dumis Duplicity is owned in Finland by the Benton Kennel. They are well known for their Welsh Spring Spaniels, but now also Golden Retrievers. This, this girl is going to be seven years, and I think she's probably the best bitch I've ever bred. Absolutely beautiful and so well campaigned. Yeah, and, and I, think, I, think, I think it says a lot about you as a breeder um, that, that when you see that kind of quality of a dog that you have, that you are um, happy to give it to somebody else to own it and to campaign it. Because many, many breeders, you know, just keep the best dogs for themselves and never want to sell uh, something good to somebody else. But you are obviously different. And I think that's that's amazing. Um, and anyhow, it was uh, there was a nice comment from from um, Andrew Brace, who says Susila was the personification of quality. So obviously he has liked her, too. Wow. Uh, okay. that's, one, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what would be the favorite win with your own dogs? Something that you won with your dogs and that you will never forget. Okay. Uh, right. Mm. I know when you start with okay, right, that it's difficult for you that you need to think a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there, there, of course, there are several occasions that springs to my mind that I will never, ever forget. Uh, I think it has to be the World Show in Stockholm, 2008. I had a lovely, lovely girl called Style Silksilla from the, mm -hmm. the late Mr. Hazel Hings. She was 10 years at the time. She was best to breed at the World Show out of an entry of 350 Golems, which is Amazing. a phenomenal entry for Sweden. It's never happened before. And she was 10 years. And she was judged by the late Anne Woodcock of the Standoff prefix and, and Margaret Woods of the Amarine prefix. And uh, Silvilla was actually best in show also at the club show the day before or two days before. So, and that ended her long, long career. And Silvilla was one of the top bitches ever in Scandinavia with, I think, 15 groups and best in show all breeds. That, that is a win that really is. Fantastic, but there yeah. have been I, I, many, many big wins. Yeah, yeah, of course, obviously. Yeah. But I, th I think, uh, uh, and I have experienced it myself. Um, uh, somehow, winning with the veterans, it makes it always more special. I think, especially if it's a big entry and something. It, uh, you know, I, I, I have not cried a lot in the ring, but I remember when I won. Um, best to breed uh, at the European show in Romania with Parpalina, the Great Dane from the veteran class. I was like, uh, they could not, you know, I was all over. So I think it's it, there is something about veterans which is which is very special. So I can understand that. Um, yeah, but I mean, Henrik, somehow, somehow it's fantastic to win with a veteran. But somehow, should a veteran really win? Is it why hasn't something happened with the breed that there are younger dogs that are even better than a veteran? But I, it's I a love, very good question. It's a very good question. Yeah, I, I love winning with my veterans, and I keep on showing them till you know, as long as they look good, as long as I think they can win. And I've been lucky with that. I've shown many veterans to, to big wins over the years. Yeah, yeah. It is. It is actually a very good question. You know, when in entry of 350 dogs, um, veteran wins best of breed. 
<clears throat> is that actually good for the breed or it's bad for the breed? But, you know, obviously it, it all has its good and bad sides. Um, tell me, Hendrik, uh, one breed you never had at home and you would like to have. I think I touched the subject a little bit earlier when I mentioned mm -hmm. the flat coat of spring. But if it has to be uh, one breed, um, it would be a field spaniel. Okay, and now yes. and now I'm going now I'm going to complicate your life. And if it yes. if it could be one breed out of the FCI Group Eight, what would it be? Uh, uh, eight. Yeah. Well, well, we live with Irish setters as well, so that's Group Seven. But yes. if you want me to go away from uh, from Group Seven, from the gun dogs or the sporting group, yes. Uh, I think, well, uh, um, could be a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, or could be, uh, okay. or could be, yeah. could be maybe possibly a wire Dax Hound as I had as a child, as a little toddler. Okay. Or possibly a Petillo Grand Bazette. Well, okay, nice breeds, definitely nice breeds. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, one dog person who is not alive anymore and you terribly miss. Okay. Uh, the, uh, it has to be Hazel Hinks of the Style Kennel. Because I, I, I really loved her and she loved me. And she was my mentor and my second mother over the years. And we had so much fun together. <clears throat> she was always, if I can tell you a short story about her. Um, of course. Of course, she started in Golas in 1953, before I was born. And she, as I told you before, she never had a big kennel. And when she came to see me the first time, which was 1980, she, she was going to judge for the first time in Sweden. And I was going to look after her. She came and see my dogs, saw my dogs. I think I had four or five bitches at the time. And I said, I was, of course, thinking, wow, I wonder what she would think about my dogs. So I said, well, please, Mrs. Hinks, what do you think about my dogs? She said, well, they're, they're lovely, but they're too short on the leg. And <laughs> I said, no, 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 they're winning a lot. Well, I don't care if they win or not. They're still short on the leg. <laughs> oh, okay. That really took me down to earth. So um, she went back, of course, to England. And then she came back after four or five years. And then she came to see me again. And I said, well... What about, what do you think now? She said, okay, Henry, that's wonderful. Same lovely type. Now they're not short on the leg, but now you have to work on the hindquarters. So it was, <laughs> it was really good to have a mentor like that. And she was, yeah. she was brutal. She said exactly what she thought, which was lovely. Yeah. Absolutely, Absolutely lovely. I miss her. And I miss the greatest all-rounder we've ever had, Hans Lettinen. Yeah. Yeah, uh, many people. Lesson. And he, he was an icon for, for all of us. And it was a, a judge you could always turn to, you could always phone in, ask him about questions about various breeds. I, I was a trainee judge under him many, many times over the years. I, I miss him terribly and uh, Mrs. Hinks. Yeah. yeah. Um, tell me, Hendrik, um, if you can think of one breeder of any breed, which has always, during all these years, impressed you with the quality of his dogs, uh, which breeder would you mention from Sweden and which one from the rest of the world? <laughs> okay, another tricky one. Yes, <laughs> I yes. only have tricky ones. <laughs> ah, yes, I'm beginning to understand that. Uh, well, yes, there are many excellent breeders, of course, in this country and in other countries. Um, well, it's very difficult to pick out one. Can it be a bit cheeky to say somebody in Scandinavia that doesn't live in Sweden? Yes, it's okay. In that case, I would nominate Espen Eng, the Yes Greyhounds. Okay. Of course, he has bred some fantastic dogs over the mm -hmm. years. I'm not a sighthound person, but I've always been extremely impressed. 
um, by that. And in Europe, in Europe, <clears throat> uh, well, I think it has to be uh, Laurent Pichard and Sanavarti Island, very Vichy American cockers. I mean, they have taken my breath away for years. And they seem to be producing these wonderful American caucus year after year after year. But again, okay. there are many fantastic breeders. Uh, uh, well, I, I'm happy to say that uh, next month, Sana and Loran are also going to be my guests in Talking Dogs with Dante. So that, that's something that I'm um, something that I'm very much looking forward to. Uh, yes. Okay, an another tricky question. Um, Imagine one thing, there is a World Dog Show in Stockholm and you are not judging there. You are showing one of your top dogs. Under which Swedish judge you would like to win Best in Show? Under which Swedish judge? Yes. Swedish judge. Okay. Somebody, to... somebody whose opinion is very important for you. Yes. Right. Uh... <laughs> Well, I hope I'm going to send a lot of people, but... Um, no, when you say one year, choice, name, then... I think my choice would be a, a judge. It's a lady who I think is a great ambassador from the Swedish Kennel Club and whose opinion I value very high. Uh, yes, René Sporre-Villes. Okay, that's... Cobbis Pugs and Norish and Lagotos. I think she is a fantastic lady, a fantastic judge. Um, no, I, I, I like what she's doing and yeah. she has done so much for the dog world. Rene, Rene is definitely somebody um, who we extremely treasure in, uh, in Croatia because um, the first Croatian-owned dog who won best in show at the European show was under Rene the famous Amstaff in, uh, when she judged best in show at the European show in Bratislava. And uh, she, she has always been a very special person to the, to the Croatian dog world. So I'm, I'm happy that you mentioned her. Um, yeah. Another tricky one. Yes, shoot, sure. come on. <laughs> uh, you have three liters at home, three big liters, and you need to choose only one puppy. And you are not sure which puppy is the best. Which three judges outside of Sweden you will invite to help you to choose the best puppy? Three judges outside Sweden to help me choose yes. the puppy. Yes, it can be somebody from the breed, it can be all rounder, it can be whoever you want. Yes. Okay. One would be Ruth Thompson from Australia. She has okay. a stellar in Adelaide. Um, I, I trust her opinion very high. She's a very clever breeder to go with her husband, Phil. Um, um, yes, let me see here. <laughs> <laughs> I think it has to be Tamas Jackel. Okay. Who is a Gandalf person with his cockers, of course. And one and more. One more. And uh, well, yeah. well, well, well. Is that Sir uh, trying to help you? Ah, uh, it's just stupid. No, I think um, Laura Pichard. Yes. Okay, wonderful. I think so. Yes, I okay. think so. Mm? Wonderful. That that would be a nice evening for sure. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I'm happy that you are struggling with my questions and uh, people who are watching, they enjoyed them. Paloma is saying best <laughs> interview ever, a lot of interesting questions. Yona is saying lovely questions, so obviously people enjoy when I put my guests a little bit on fire like this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, if you would need to thank five people in your life who helped you to become what you are today in the dog world, who would you thank? All right. Five people. Five people. Five people. Okay. Um, 
It would be a Swedish lady. Her name is Karin Eriksson. We imported a few dogs together in the 80s. And uh, we're great friends. And that was, she was a big mentor to me. And we, um, we had a lot of fun. And uh, now that was a big improvement in my candle and career, for sure. And then, because when I started going to the UK, I mean, I went to Crafts 1972 the first time. And I <clears throat> later stayed with Marigold Timpson of the Garima Kennel. This lady passed away 10 years ago or more. <clears throat> no, maybe more, maybe more, maybe it's 20 years, never mind. Um, it's, it's, she, she gave me some beautiful dogs. It was a good start and I stayed with her in 74 when I lived in England. And it has to be Hazel Hinks, the style lady that was my mentor and second mother. And then it would be one, two, three. It must be Mrs. Tudor of the Camrose Kennel. Okay. And can I and can I help you? Can I help you to? Uh, can I help you for the number five so you can have a happy life? No. <laughs> <laughs> you you know what you need to say. I know what you want to say. <laughs> no, no, not me. I, I I'm saying you know what no, no. you should say. <laughs> I, okay. No, I think it has to be uh, the, the Valerie Foss. Valerie Foss. Yeah, okay. yeah. Great. <laughs> Your life person. Is, yes. N nice. Life definitely. Is, nice. My life is going to be tricky. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I <laughs> wanted to say probably five nice people, but your life will become a hell very soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me see where, where am I with my... Uh, okay. One dog of any breed, obviously uh, not, not Golden Retriever, uh, that you have seen somewhere in one dog show and you will never forget? Not that I have judged, just seen. Yeah, dog, yeah. Dog I have seen. It, it can be also one dog that you have judged, it's okay. Oh, ah, yeah. Just, mm. just not the Golden. No, 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 okay. Um... Okay, uh, I will go back to the World Show in Stockholm 2008. The Sealyham Terrier that went best in show, that also went best in show at Crafts 2009. Um, Elps Hidalgo are great, or good spice. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, we I know. Thought, I thought that was a spectacular dog from any angle. I mean, I'm not in the Terrier world, but that dog really took my breath away, I must say. And then seeing Best in Show across the following year, that was fantastic. Yeah. But, that, that, yeah. but I don't judge terriers, so I'm not a terrier. Yeah. Person, but it's okay. I thought that was um, uh, anyhow, um, I, there is a comment from a person called Sjör Jobse saying, <laughs> please, next time, uh, ask for six people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Ruth Thompson is saying, you've just lost your kennel, boy. So, <laughs> anyhow, and uh, to stay on the nice side, there is a, a question from Kerry, who is asking you, you don't look old enough to be breeding so long. What's your secret to, for staying so youthful? <laughs> well, I have a fountain of youth in my garden. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, Wonderful. Well, when when can I visit? When can I visit? I send it tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Well, thank, thank, okay. Thank you. So, thank you for the nice comment. Thank you. The, uh, I must say this is very rude for you because I have invited myself to your house and you said no, no, no. I will send you. So I'm not welcome. You will send me that. Okay. Uh, sure. We need to talk later on after this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, if you were offered to judge three national specialties in the USA in the breeds of your choice, what would they be? All uh, right, three nationals in the US. It would be Golden Let's... Retriever. Golden okay. Retriever. Yes, my breed for sure. Of course. Um, let's see here in the US uh, the type and the different standards. Um, GSP, 
Do you want me to okay. you want me to out? Yes. Spectacular, okay. sound, athletic, wonderful breed with the most beautiful head. Um, lovely breed, lovely breed. Okay. America. American cockers. American cockers. I would love Wonderful. to jump them in the US. I did them once in, in San Francisco about 25 years ago, and that was fantastic. But mm, that would be a thrill of my life, for sure. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, okay, another tricky one. If for some reason, let's say tomorrow or next month, you decide to stop breeding golden retrievers, we are talking hypothetically, obviously, and uh, you give away all of your dogs, you stay with zero dogs at home, and in five years, you want to start again, to which kennel you are going to buy a golden retriever puppy? Okay. Um, I would go overseas. Okay. I would go, I would go far away to a different continent. Okay. Um, <laughs> I would go as far as Australia. Okay. And I would, and I would go to Adelaide, to Ruth Thompson of the Schuller Kennel. Um, I have seen her dogs and judged some of them for almost 30 years. And uh, this breeder has the same type, the same style, style as I have. And there are no boundaries. She uses the dogs she wants. She imports semen. Um, yes, I would, I would turn to her. Okay, actually. wonderful. Uh, um, I have only two more questions. These difficult ones, I mean. <laughs> Again. Um, yes. If you could improve one thing in your dogs today, what would you like to improve? What I want to improve in my dogs today. Yeah, well, there's always something. Um, today, I struggle a little bit with high tail, which I don't like. Um, okay. I've, I've got it somehow, and I'm struggling a little bit to get away with it. Um, and I have okay. a problem so, yeah. with yeah, it happens. And sometimes um, I need to improve on the front fronts. I don't like this east-westy fronts. That is, it's not common, but you can see it in Golens, and I'm not too fond of that. And I struggle a little bit with the fronts and the high tail. And the tail. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last question, and the most important question of tonight. I mean, not the last question, the last difficult question. When okay. is Henrik Frickstrand going to join Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm on Instagram, isn't that enough? <laughs> well, okay, yes, but you know. Uh, well, I guess I'm, yeah, well, I don't know. Well, I, I never thought it was a good idea. I never had any reason to do it, but you, said you should never say never. So, so maybe one okay. day I will surprise you. Okay, let's see, let's see. Uh, okay, that was, that was about difficult questions. Uh, let me just check on a few of the comments that we had in the meaning time. Uh, okay, Alan was asking overall, what will you improve on your breathing? This we have asked. Uh, let me see, there was one. Um, Emily is asking you any tips for someone who has never showed Goldens before or starting out? A person who wants to start showing Goldens, yes. Well, yes. first of all, first of all, I hope, well, if this person hasn't got a Golden already, I suggest buy a pure bred Golden from a well-renowned kennel and explain that you want to show that you're interested and really keen. Read the standard. Get a mentor, read and study as much as you can. Go to dog shows, um, look at other dogs, see how they are turned out, how they are groomed, how they are handled, and try to get a mentor. I, I think that would okay. be uh, the most important things. I mean, without okay. a mentor, you're stuck. You always, I mean, I had fantastic mentors in, in, in Scandinavia and in the UK. And that helped me a lot. So you really need a yeah. mentor, someone to be honest, 
also can be a little bit cruel maybe and but uh, honest yeah okay we have a question from freda morris who is asking you hendrik what is your view on over angulation that has crept into our breed that some breeders think is now the norm with long stipples and hawks standing well behind mm. yeah we touched the subject before i don't like yes. it over angulated stifles not good at all uh, and with the hawks no not nice it it should be penalized it destroys the balance and most usually also the movement so, okay uh fanny hellstrom del wolfe is uh, is saying i think you should definitely hope that the breed would have improved over time but in this uh, case sixilla as an individual was exceptional her win doesn't necessarily mean the breed hadn't improved over her lifetime do you agree hendrik yes i agree excellent, excellent. <laughs> good comment okay let me see if we have more questions uh huh, huh, huh. let me see uh, Barbara Krumpak is asking you which part, judging, breeding, or showing, would be the hardest to let go? Judging, breeding, and showing. Or showing. Which one yes. would be the hardest to let go? Breeding. I'm a breeder. Breed. I am okay. definitely a breeder, and for me, it's the icing on the cake. To be a judge and to be able to see beautiful dogs and sometimes less beautiful dogs. And I have been fortunate to see dogs in many, many places in, in Scandinavia and around the world. So, uh, but I'm, I'm a breeder, definitely. Okay, wonderful. That's always nice to hear. Um, okay, I, there are a few more questions, but we are going to touch uh, some of them with my next questions. So. Uh, let's start with that, and, and then uh, I can I can join also this question from our viewers. Um, this my first question is: When we start talking about breeding, do you know how many champions did you breed? Yes, two hundred eleven. Two hundred and eleven. That's nice. Yes. Yeah, uh, that's that's uh, nice. Course, okay. But uh, you know, I mean. This could never have happened if I haven't had the wonderful team of very good and close friends and fantastic puppy buyers in so many places. We, we work together uh, and we try the best. And for me, that is so important. I could never have done this alone, never, ever. Because yeah. these wonderful friends, they can paint the dogs. And we, we are just a great team. And I feel so lucky and honored to have them and it's yeah. not only in sweden it's in many many countries and places and i'm really honored about that yeah that's great uh in, in the same way lindsay marshall is asking you um how many dogs you have at home i have six adults and two youngsters they are now eight months that's nice then i have so. i have a few dogs also co-owned with very close friends but I don't want to have a big kennel. So for me, this is a good number right now. And I lost one of my old boys earlier, well, just three, four months ago. So it was seven then, but I never had more than 10 dogs. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, there are now coming some questions. And now I remember there was one question um, about, uh, about ice. Uh, which I have obviously lost because the, obviously so many comments are coming that I lose. So I can, I'm asking whoever was posting that question just to put it again, and I will be happy to read it. Um, I want to ask you, how do you decide uh, who will be the parents of your next litter? Okay, well, <clears throat> I evaluate my, my female, my bitch. Uh, what are her good points? What are the less good points? Is she good enough for breeding to start with? Is she a better dog than her parents and her mother? And I look at her thinking, what can you give me? Uh, and then I try to find a dog that uh, in my mind would suit her. Pedigree, looks, temperament. 
Um, you never get maybe what you want in the first generation, but I always think a couple of generations ahead. Uh, I mean, uh, and I, I do line breeding and type breeding. Um, I never do, well, I've done one total outcross when I used the North American dog 10 years ago. But normally when I do an outcross, what I say outcross, it still has to be 25% my type or pedigree. So that means 75% new. Okay. So, I, I, so you, uh, would, you, would never, you would never do a complete outcross again? Mm, well, I never say never, but it's yeah. not something that I really believe in. Um, because if, if, if you force me to use a total outcross pedigree-wise, it has to be my type. Yeah. I feel. But I might change my mind, but that's how I feel right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, Cindy is asking, and there, there have been, I read also to you before in the beginning, there have been few people asking uh, um, about the same thing. What are your thoughts on reducing inbreeding as recommended by some kennel clubs? In general, obviously, there are kennel clubs who are um, trying to, to make quite a lot of limitations on inbreeding, line breeding, and so on. Uh, what, how do you feel about that? I'm not too happy about it. The, the thing is, if in my mind anyway, if you're line breeding, uh, you must know what you're line breeding to. You shouldn't just do line breeding because of the word line breeding. You must be sure what you're line breeding to. We all know that you, only, you don't only get the good points, you can get the less good points. And I know that in some kind of clubs, also in Sweden, um, they, they want us to have more outcrosses, not so close breeding. Um, I must tell you that the best stud dog I ever had, he was from Ireland, from the Erin Dairy Kennel. He was called Gaelic Minstrel. He was extremely closely line bred. All the famous dogs in the UK. And he was a fantastic producer. Um, also for soundness. And he's now behind all my dogs and we've doubled on him, on him and trebled on him many, many times. So I am not worried about close breeding unless you know what you're doing. Yeah. You must have the knowledge, you must have done your homework, so you, you really know uh, what to expect. Sometimes you, you do wrong things and you, have mis you do mistakes, but that's how it is. That, is. that is dog breeding. This is not a computer we're, doing, we're dealing with. Yeah, yeah that's, that, that's, for, that's for sure. Let me, let me just try to find um there was one question uh, uh, uh. let me see if i can if i can find it because there are so many questions and so many comments no probably i have lost it there was a, a question about um one particular dog and i think it's the one that you have mentioned now but um anyhow um yeah maybe the person can just post the question uh, question again because I, I lost the comment. Um, what I want to ask you um, when you when you get the litter and uh, you want let's say to choose the best puppy of the litter, um, when when do you choose it? At what age do you do you sh choose your show prospect? And uh, what are actually from the puppy age uh, the main things that you look on one puppy? Okay, as a breeder. Um... Well, you always look at the puppies all the time, every day, always, always. But from six weeks on, I, I really started to start to look at them with a different sort of eye. As you say, a show prospect. I want to see puppies running around, moving around. I want to see the balance, how they carry themselves, uh, how they look on the trot. You know, if they've got some style, some elegance. It's, it's not a table breed. Of course, I put them on the table also to see the angulation, but mostly I prefer to see them moving because you can see a lot on that. Um, but um, and at what, what, what age, let's say, you make the final decision which puppy you will keep or sell to somebody for the shows? Um, I, I was taught from my English mentors, if I remember correctly, that you choose the puppies when they are six weeks. Or okay. maybe seven, six weeks. That's what I heard in the 70s. But 
I can't do that. I, I look at the puppies when they're eight weeks, and if I'm not sure what to do, I keep them for another month or two months or six months. Uh, and then I try to do we, the other We all do the same. <laughs> oh, but not the whole litter, of course, but the ones I really like. Um, I, I try to do that because I know that my puppies, they must look good between, between four and six months. If I'm not happy with the looks when they are six months, uh, I feel they can go. I don't look at them when they are seven or eight months because then they can look a bit horrible, but then normally, if I'm lucky, fingers yeah. crossed and all that, they will be okay when they are 12 months. So okay. if I'm in any doubt, I, I will keep them a bit longer, which is a hassle okay. because you have to train them, socialize and have fun with them. And it's of always course. hard to get rid of them, but I think yeah. that's the best way if, if it's possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, here is the question, I have found it. Uh, it was from Christy Tamer, she's asking, uh, what was it about Erin Derigelic Ministrel that made him one of your choices to line breed to? He was a, such a marvelous dog in any respect. Yes, I'm a little bit colorblind about that because I love that dog. It's, okay. it's a funny story. It's a funny story, actually, I must tell you, Ante, because uh, I, I knew the breeder from earlier on and... Uh, it came to me when he was four years of age. He was sold as a puppy to another family in Ireland. And for some reason, he came back to the breeder. And I went over to look at one of the Irish club shows one year. And the breeder, Miss Collins, she was there. And this Gaelic minstrel, he was there. He was called Finn. And uh, he, he was there. And I just fell in love with him directly. He was everything I dreamed of. The most fantastic head and expression in my mind. Beautiful neck, construction, top line, substance, angle, movement, temperament to die for. I just loved him. Okay. So I asked Mr. Yeah. Mrs. Collins if it would be possible for me to possibly have him for a short while in Sweden. And uh, after lots of hesitation, they said, well, yeah, well, for a short while, let's say six months or something like that. So I was very lucky. <clears throat> it took about four or five months before we organized all the papers. And I went over to fetch him five days before the big Stockholm show, which is in December every year. He was entered at the show. I took him to the show. He was best of breed. Wonderful. And that was absolutely amazing. And then he just kept on winning. And then Catherine, the breeder, came to see me six months later. And she stayed with me and she said, well, he loves you. And you love him, he's a present, he's yours. So he That's stayed nice. and lived a long, long, lovely life here. And I loved him and I miss him. He was a very special dog and for sure the best star dog I, I've ever had. Wonderful. That's a nice story. Um, uh, Agatha is asking you, what would be your limitations in breeding concerning health issues? As you have lots of experience with breeding, and probably you saw a lot of, uh, of it regarding genetics. Is the question if I would uh, breed yeah, what, from, from, uh, from light OCD or is that the question or what? Oh, I, suppose, I suppose, let's say she's asking you if you would use a dog that is a carrier for a genetic disease, whichever genetic disease. If, it, if we're talking about ICT, the ichthyosis, the flakes, yes, for yeah, sure. I, would. I don't know. She, she didn't uh, specify. Yeah, but I can say that in, in, in my mind, I want to breed from clinically healthy dogs. I don't breed on paper, just for hips, eyes, blah, 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 elbows. If I have a fantastic female with maybe a naught one on the elbow, which means very light OCD, she comes from a good litter, good parents. I would use a star dog who is a good producer. Yes, I would use her. I wouldn't disregard her just because she has a light OCD. Or, yeah. or the same with the hips. If she's got a C hip on one hip, I would look on the siblings. How are they? What's the background? And which star dog to use? Um, for me, I look at the whole picture, the whole balance. Not just, okay. I'm not eating from a single point. Okay. Um, yeah. The qu the question that we had before was 
um, about the ice. Uh, what do you think about the UK introducing GONIO test as a primary test? Whatever that is. Yeah, well, I don't have much opinion and experience about that, so I think I will pass on that one. Yeah, OK. Uh, let me see if we got some. OK, now I, I can continue with my. Um, I want to <laughs> ask you, uh, I want to ask you, Hendrik, a um, few questions about your dogs, because there have been some of your dogs which have made history in this way or that way. So I think it would be nice to 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 try to remember them. Um, first of all, can you remember um, you had a dog called Yumi's Chrysander, who was the first Swedish Golden Retriever to win Best in Show in Sweden at the Kennel Club's All Breeds Show? How could I forget that? <laughs> no, 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 of course I remember. He was born 1980. The mother I imported from the UK together with a friend, and her name was Norton Wood Just Amanda. She was a Cameron Cabers Christopher daughter. I went to Norway and I used a dog called Noraven Lucius, going back to the Cameron's line. And uh, I bred Chrysander. I didn't own him. He was owned by Karen Eriksson, who I imported dogs with during the 80s. And he was 18 months. And it was shown in the south of Sweden at a dog show in Malmö, one of the most southern cities. And much to our surprise, and wow, he was best in show. And the judge was Hans Lettinen. So oh, I was wonderful. so and happy about that. Um, he was the yeah. first Swedish bred golden to go best in show all breeds. And he continued yeah. to do a lot of winning over the years. Wonderful. Um, there have been, when we started to talk, um, uh, and and we spoke a little bit about about that already um, about this female called Steel Six Silla uh, who won best of breed at the World Dog Show when she was ten years of age. Uh, um, there were a lot of people who were saying, "Tell us a little bit more about her. She was the best golden ever." What was so special about her? <laughs> yes. Okay. Absolutely. One of my all-time favorites. I remember when I was going over to Mrs. Hazelhings at the Style Kennel to choose her as a puppy. Uh, the breeder had kept, if I remember correctly, three or four females. So they were about eight weeks, nine weeks possibly. They were all running around in the kitchen and we were looking at the puppies. And Mrs. Hinks put one of her of the bitches on the table and she said, what do you think? Oh, she's lovely. Well, this is the one I'm keeping, she said. Oh, she's lovely. But I... I actually had my eyes on another puppy rushing around all the time on the floor, you know. And I, well, what about this one? So I put that one on the table. Well, she's hopeless. She won't stand still. And she's wagging the tail all the time. She's nothing for an old lady, so I can't keep her. So I said, well, that suits me just perfect, Mrs. Hinks, because you can have yours and I can have still Stilla. Yeah. So that's how she came to me. She was a handful, wagging her tail on her toes, a little bit like a flat coat, which is lovely mm -hmm. to have in the show ring. But she had a, a on and off button so she could actually also sleep. <laughs> she yes, was sometimes. She started winning yeah. when she was one year. And uh, she kept winning during all these years. And she had a best in show, all breeds. And I think about 15 Gandalf groups. Uh, and she was also a fantastic mother. She was actually a mother of Jumi Silkscreen, the dog I mentioned, I thought was the yeah, best yeah. dog. I yeah. And she was the mother of him, and she, I think she produced 16 champions in all, in, in four liters. Wonderful. And, um, and yeah, I forgot to say that, because Silkscreen's father was Gaelic Minstrel, uh, the Arendary dog. He was also the father. Yeah. And another thing about Silksilla was that she had C hips, which normally okay. you shouldn't breed from. But I always thought she is just outstanding in so many ways. So I thought, well, I want to try. So I was a little bit smart. So I used an older star dog the first time. I think it was eight or nine years. And he was, had a very good record for producing excellent hips. So I used him, had a lovely litter with three or four champions. I kept one dog, a male called Jumis 
Silk Venture, who also produced good hips. And uh, we x-rayed all of Silk Silla's progeny, 24 in all. I think she had three with C hips. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. So the first, time, yeah, of course. the first time I used the older Swedish dog, the next time I used Gaelic minstrel, and that produced Silk Screen in Hungary and Silk Symphony with Andrei Stepinski in Poland, and I had a couple of bitches here. So it, it, she proved to be a wonderful brood bitch as well, in spite of the sea hip. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, it is, it is what you said before, you know, we don't need to eliminate dogs for one a fault if you can have open mind and think how to deal with that obviously it can happen great results like like you had with her um yes. you had also a bitch called uh, a leading lady who was the first continental golden to win cc at crafts what what kind of experience that was oh. are you asking me if i remember that <laughs> no 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 oh, i'm no, asking no. you what kind uh, of what kind of experience was it <laughs> <laughs> I'm just pulling your leg. Well, yeah. lady, um, it's, it's a funny story about her. She was really, really lovely. She was the only female in the litter. There were five or six males, but she was the only female. And I was going to have her in partnership with a wonderful family who actually had her mother. And I remember when the lady came to, to get her, she said, well, did you think, is, is, is she okay? Is she going to be beautiful? And I said, well, she's good enough. Good enough for you. Okay? And uh, sort of, <laughs> she wasn't an ugly duckling. I can't say she was an ugly duckling. But anyway, she turned into a swan. And she was always campaigned by Ulrika. She's a very close friend of mine. And she has beautiful dogs for me as well. And Ulrika handled her all over Scandinavia and in Europe. And she was qualified for crops. She was going to cross 2008 because, well, I said to Erika and to the lady who, who co-owned her, well, she would she will not ever be placed. She will not be placed, but just happy to be there. And Erika handled her at Crafts. I was sitting at the ringside, and much to our surprise, she won the class. She won the CC under a breed specialist and Faulkner <laughs> of the sign and prefix. And that was just a day we will never, ever forget. Yeah. Fabulous. I mean, she was the yeah. first overseas female to, to, to win at Crafts. So that feeling still remains the same. You know, we were all, oof, you know, amazing. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's great. And, and also uh, an interesting fact, um, if I read well about her, is that she produced eight champion puppies in a litter of eight. Correct. I, when she was going to have a litter, I used a dog in the south of Spain, in Cordoba. It was an English import. His name uh, was Ritzlin Ricochet. And uh, the breeder, uh, Paloma, and, and, um, and uh, came, she came to Sweden with the male, and we mated in the winter, and she had eight puppies, and I kept a boy, and his name is Lawrence of Arabia, and he's now okay. 11 years. Yeah, and he's now 11 years, and he proved to be a wonderful star dog as well. And Ricochet, <clears throat> uh, he had plenty of color. He was a dark dog. Uh, a little bit different in style and type, but again, had 25% of my style and my line behind him. So I had a wonderful litter. Eight puppies, eight champions with various people. I didn't own them all. I only owned two of them. So yeah. that was and I mean, yeah, you, you had also a bitch called Diversity who had 10 champions out of 11 in the same litter. I mean, how often these kind of things happen to you? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is quite funny. I, I must tell you this as well, because Lawrence of Arabia, who was one of the eight champions, um, his daughter, the most famous daughter, was due with diversity. And uh, she was going to have puppies when she was three years. So I wanted to use a star dog in England, uh, a star dog that was the top star dog, all breeds, 
And I think the top gun, spa dog in gun dogs for many years. And his name, he was bred in Spain, and his name was, is, he's been alive, of course, Santansar, say it again, Chardonnay. He lives in Wales with the breeder, Mrs. Joy. And this was in March, and I was working. So I had to phone my boss saying, well, could I have one week holiday? <laughs> in March, he said, uh, yes, so what are you going to do? Are you going on a sunny holiday? No, I'm going to the UK, to Wales. All right. Uh, what are you going to do there, if I may ask? I said, well, you do may ask, but you won't approve. Um, well, I'm going to make one of my bitches to start dog in Wales. <laughs> he nearly had a heart attack thinking, God, my man, haven't you got any boys yourself at home? And I said, yeah. yes, I do have star dogs at home. But the thing is, I want to be one step ahead of the other breeders. So okay. I, I traveled all the way to the UK and I used this dog who was called Archie, who was a grand, who is a grandson of my Gaelic minstrel. So again, going back to my line, I had 11 puppies, 10 got the title, and the 11th has a reserve CC. And I, it was, I mean, they were handled and shown by other people. I didn't show them all, absolutely not. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, she, was, she was a fantastic brood bitch, and um, she, I think, she has another six champions. So yeah. she was. I, I think, I think, I think what we what we need to mention, um, because when we talk like this, you know, somebody would say, okay, one liter, you know, ten champions, okay. But you know, we need to put it in a perspective that this is these are golden retrievers. I mean, there is no country in the world where there is no big competition in golden retrievers. That makes it, I think, even more special because, you know, it's not one breed where you have one or two entered dogs. You know, you can never have a class with less than 20 anywhere in the world. So obviously, I mean, that makes it more difficult and, and more special, that, that's for sure. Um, there, yeah. is, there is a question from um, Antti Hokanen. Um, she's asking you, as a breeder, you have developed a strong bitch line going for many generations. When planning a litter, do you pay greater um, attention to a bitch line behind the potential sire or go for what the dog presents itself in type? Good question. Bitch line. Always a bitch line. My mentors in the 70s explained really so many times to me that the bitch line is the strength of any kennel. So I emphasized on having a strong bitch line. And today, actually, I have five different bitch lines going. So if something goes wrong with one bitch line, I can always use one of the others. Yeah. So if I'm choosing a star dog, I'm not interested in um, his sire. I'm more interested in his bitch line. Is it a solid bitch line that I believe, that I think could produce the quality I want? For me, that is important, and of course, I must like the dog. You must compliment my bitch. Of course, but yes, of course. Bitch line, bitch yeah. line, always, always. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me read you just one comment, and there have been many, um, many, many uh, nice comments. Uh, let me let me read you this one. It it is from Radka, who says, "I have a huge smile through all this interview." What a lovely time and so great to be part of this kind of um, sharing of information and stories about dogs we all know and have in our pedigrees. So I'm happy, uh, uh, Henrik, you must be very popular because you are speaking for one hour and 50 minutes and you have still over 300 people watching you live. So that's absolutely <laughs> amazing, amazing number. And now when we are talking about this um, and when we start talking a little bit about judging, um, there was a question in the beginning somewhere from Joao Vasco Pocas, um, who was asking, um, in a way, um, uh, if you would judge in Europe and have a dog that looks completely American in type, uh, how would you judge him? Because he says he has noticed that some judges in the FCI have been putting up uh, American American type dogs. Okay. Uh, right. Again, a little bit of a funny story. I had the honor to judge uh, the World Show in Helsinki, which was 
98 or 99, right? I was doing the Goldens, the Males, and much to my surprise, in the champion class came a dog that really stood out like a sore thumb. Typical American, but not very good American type. With a Mexican handler, I realized afterwards there was a Mexican handler, very good handler. And it was a big class, maybe 20, 25 champions. And every time I went around the ring and got closer to this American, well, Mexican dog, it was a lot of cheering and clapping because all the fan club from Mexico was there trying to, okay. you know, promote the dog. And as soon as I passed the dogs, all the cheering and clapping stopped. <laughs> okay. Obviously, he was, yes. he, was, he, was, he was a nice dog. Uh, he got an excellent, but then he wasn't placed. But here in Europe, we, we have a different standard. And the American dogs, if they're shown here, they must fit our standard. Um, so uh, it, it really depends. I, I, I mentioned before some of the American dogs are, well, a lot of them actually, are really, really beautiful. So groomed, handled our way, I think they could win. With a judge that is a bit open-minded, probably judge them in North America. Um, yes, it, it could happen. Yeah. But it won't, okay. it, won't be, it won't be easy. Yeah, um, you are you are judging you are judging two groups. Um, obviously, let's let's put uh, Goldens aside. Um, if I would ask you what is your second favorite breed to judge, what would you say? And and which one out of these groups you would say that let's say is a breed that is very difficult to you to judge? Okay. Um... Right. <laughs> what do I prefer to judge outside Golden? Uh, flat coat is very close to my heart. Okay. And they are, of course, closely related also to the Golden Retrievers, uh, for sure. Um, spring Spaniels it comes close to the flat coats. I love the Spring Spaniels. I've been English or Welsh? English, well, Welsh as well, but mm, I was thinking about English fingers. A breed that is difficult to judge, which you really have to understand, is the duck tolling retriever. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've seen and been happy to judge a few that I really, really love, and I know they have fantastic duck tollers in Finland, for example. And when you get a really nice duck tolling retriever, that is amazing. I was judging yeah. in Croatia two, three years ago, and I gave the group to a, a duck tolling retriever. And later I heard this was, this dog uh, won the breed of Crafts, I think, the year before. Possible, possible. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. But it, you really yeah. have to understand the breed, see, see the good points, and don't think they are yeah. ugly gold retrievers. Yeah. Um, I, I need to ask you a, another question. Um, and this is something that I ask to all of my guests. Uh, some people, when they started to judge a lot, they decided that they will also stop breeding and showing. Some people have continued to do that, um, obviously, till the rest of their, uh, their life. Um, is it difficult to show under your colleagues? And is it difficult to judge dogs when they are shown by your colleagues? When I went to the judging course, in, in Sweden in, in 1987, I remember that one of the teachers said that it won't be easy for you because some of you are actually breeders and now you will become a judge. You will have problems if, you don't, if you're not careful in the future. Of course, you have to be careful you're not putting up somebody because it's owned by a fellow judge. Um, so I, I, I want to take a good dog under a, a judge because some judges know that I am a judge. So I never want to do a stupid thing like showing a bad dog or a mediocre dog. I always want to show good dogs. Whether they win or not, that is not the main thing. But I want to show quality dogs that I think could win this okay. day or maybe another day. 
Um, and when I'm judging, I'm trying hard just to be objective, not being just putting up this or that. Because I, I want to go home and I want to be able to sleep well during the night. Not because yeah. I put up this, putting any political mind into it. Because yeah. it's, a lot of discuss, it's a lot of discussion anyway around the ringside. Who is winning? Why this dog is winning? It's just because this and that. And uh, I, want to sleep, I want to sleep well during the night, doing the thing. Yeah. I I'm, I, I'm, I'm not sure you will sleep well tonight, but that's another subject. <laughs> <laughs> not connected, not connected I, with judging. Uh, <laughs> I, I doubt I will. Yeah. Anyhow, um, I want to ask you one thing about judging, and that's something that always um, uh, impressed me uh, about people who are judging that kind of breeds, like golden retrievers. Um, when you come, for example, at the U.S. National, or when you come to Crafts and you have a class of 100, 150 dogs, I mean, how do you make the selection? How do you remember all these dogs? How do you pick them up? What do you do? How, I mean, how does it work? How does it work? Well, if you thinking of the US National with the, when I had 151 dogs at the same time in the ring, they were all divided into, group, into groups of 10. So that means I, had, I was left with 10 dogs in the ring, all the others were outside, and I went through all these 10 dogs, and then I selected the dogs I felt were really outstanding. Could have been two dogs, could have been five dogs or six dogs from that particular group. And, so, and then all those dogs, they went out and the next group of 10 came in the ring and I did the same. And when I had gone through all these 150 dogs, I had all the selected dogs back. And then, then I did another selection and another selection. I never take notes. I try to use my brain or my memory. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because if I take notes, I will be just stressed by looking at the numbers and the notes. I try to look at the dogs instead. And yeah. when, when you're judging at big shows with big numbers, I do the same. I, I, I try to memorize, yes, this I like, that I like. Yeah. So I, I don't take notes. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay. Um, I have two more questions for you. We have been okay. talking for two hours. Uh, but before that, um, well, uh, I have asked you to, to, to send uh, five pictures that are very important for your life. Uh, then you have asked for seven. That's when, you, when I approved seven, you have asked if it could be one more. And I have agreed. I didn't mind it at all. Um, so we have eight photos uh, that we are going to show now to our viewers uh, who are watching. And you are going to explain uh, why these photos are important for you and tell us the story behind. So Beltran mm -hmm. is now going to put them, put them on the screen. Um, picture number one is showing, um, well, I will, I will show you like this. So you can see it. I think it's young Hendrik with a lot of hair uh, showing. Tell, tell, us something, tell us something about this picture. Yes, that is one of my foundation bitches. Uh, her name was Dainty's Bachelor Girl, bred by Philip Johnson. And she's the one who had this Camrose, Ambria, and Stubble Down background. And on that photo, she was best in show. I think she was eight years. So this must have been oh, 78, 79, something like that. When I was born. How nice. <laughs> right, yes. <yeah. laughs> when I won my first best in show. Yeah. And uh, it was quite funny because the other, the other girl I had from the other foundation, Angelique, she also went best in show when she was old, um, under Joe Braddon. And she won the group under L.C. James, you know, the Wendover Irish setters. So that is also a nice memory from the 70s. That's a long way back. Yeah. Uh, second picture that you sent is uh, you sitting with the three goldens in front of a small airplane. Yes. Is, is, are you not going to display the photo? Okay, tell us that story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, the sure. photo will be now. Yeah. Ah, 
Okay, okay. The photo is coming. It goes, it goes a little bit slower because you and I talk and the things are uh, coming on Facebook with a little delay, but the picture is now on screen for everyone to see. Okay, good. Goody, goody. Yes, well, um, we have had lots of fun over the years. I had, I had a puppy buyer and he wanted the air mileage. He had a, a small aircraft one with one engine or with two engines. And I was thinking, this is in the 80s, well, wouldn't that be a great idea to fly to some, some shows instead of driving for 18 hours or 15 hours or whatever, especially to Norway. <clears throat> Norway is the most beautiful country, as you know, but it takes forever on the Norwegian roads because of, of, of the landscape. So we, so we were flying to the north of Norway, to Tromsø, to Narvik, to Trondheim, Bergen, Stavanger. And I think the first time was um, 86, 87, together with Bitte Oren, or the Italian, okay. Italian Greyhounds. Yes. She was, she was with me with two of her dogs, and it was a Cocker Spaniel breeder as well. And I had two Goldens. So I think we, we, we took off about four or five in the morning. It took about two hours to get there instead of about 20 hours drive. <laughs> so Bitte won everything with her dogs. The Cocker Spaniels won everything. I won nothing. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> we had a great time. And then we went back in the evening. We could sleep on the flight. Uh, and the pilot, he was happy because he got the mileage, the mileage in the air. And that was perfect. And he just went to the dog show for a little while to have a look. And then he went to, to have his sleep so he could fly home. So it was That's perfect. great. <laughs> back in the and that particular photo, I was with, with Ragnhild, with the Almanza. And mm -hmm. I think we were in Bergen on the west coast. And on this photo, it is Style Silk Silla on the left. It is Marjama's masterpiece in the middle. And the darker okay. dog is a dog... I leased for one year from England, from the, from the lanes. His name was Kulovan Rainbow Man. And he came here as a seven-year-old dog in the state for one year. And he was a top gun dog that year. And you see, he's a dark dog. I don't mind color yes. at all. So yeah. we had a double show in Bergen. And they all got the titles. So we were very happy. I think, we had, about seven, I think we had about seven dogs on the flight. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. I, I, I uh, tell you, it wasn't very popular with the, breed, with the Norwegian exhibitors. I Here imagine. comes the <laughs> Swedish gang, the Swedish team again, and this time they have a private airplane. <laughs> but yeah. it, it was fun. Typ it was lots of fun. Typical of mafia, you know, to come with the private jet to a dog yes, show. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Swedish mafia. <laughs> Swedish mafia. Uh, okay. Uh, third photo that we have uh, is representing a very young Jolt Hano and a very young Boss Kalin. <laughs> <laughs> this is oh, oh, oh. this is uh, silk screen, and um, this is the dog I am so proud of to have bred from by Erin Derry Gaelic Minstrel and Style Silk Silla, and here he was winning the group. Somewhere, I don't remember where it was. In Bratislava. It is, it is the best to breed at Bratislava, yes. If I can yeah. read, it is 2009. I think yeah. I read it well. Yeah. 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 This, I'm extremely proud of this dog. I mean, he is exactly what I dream of. The outline, the style, the elegance, the movement, and presented to perfection from Zod. And yeah. he had a beautiful family that looked after the dog. He was called Storm. And he had a long and lovely life. And he is a dog I told you was best to breed at his last show when he was 11 years in Milan. Wonderful. So I'm really uh, proud of him. Yeah. Uh, picture number four is showing you um, judging best in show in Scotland with an English Springer as your winner. Yes. Yes. This is one of the highlights in my career, judging the Gundog breeds of Scotland. I, I judged best in show. It was the, the group, and when it was also a best in show, of course. I had a most fabulous lineup I've ever seen in a gun dog group. I was really, really spoiled for choices. 
And uh, I loved this Springer when it came into the ring because it had that typical Springer movement. The overall balance, the style, the, the outline, he really took my eye. It wasn't an easy choice because the lineup was really, really tough, but I loved him. His name is, oh. he came, he was actually imported from Australia. Sandy Cam, the look of love. Beautiful, beautiful dog. And he did so well in England and in Ireland. Of course, he made up, was made up. And um, at, at, the, the, at, the, at the show, I remember that number two was a GSP imported from the US. Beautiful dog. Okay. And number three was a pointer from New Zealand. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. But, well, I don't know how popular that was, because the only UK bred dog <laughs> was English setter. That was number okay. four. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I probably didn't, <laughs> probably didn't go down very well that I put out an Australian dog, an American dog, and a New Zealand dog. But the lineup was fantastic, and it was really a, a highlight of my career, I must say. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, picture number four, no, number five, uh, is you as a part, I think it is you, I, my eyesight is so bad. Anyhow, it's it's a... Uh, breeding breeding group, uh, Dumis, I see short as the first one here standing proudly, uh, two girls, and then I don't know if this is you or not, but uh, <laughs> tell, us, tell us about it. <laughs> yeah, um, this is uh, one of my breeder groups, uh, and uh, it is in, in Denmark at the World Show in Herning in North Denmark, 2010. And we went best breeders group in show. And the judge is Marianne Holm Hansen of the Telegold prefix. So I'm really, really proud of that. And uh, they are not siblings, the dogs. They're all different. And it's me together with, with Shore, and then it's Ulrika and Fanny handling. So we were really, okay. really proud of so it was a great day, absolutely fantastic. And we take great pride in showing the, the breeder groups, uh, as you know, we do here, in, in yes. especially in yeah. Scandinavia. Yes. In Scandinavia, absolutely, yeah. Okay, next picture that we have is, uh, I would say, you judging Golden Retriever set crafts. Yes. Yes. Because there have been so many photos of the winners, so I selected instead my reserve CC. Okay. So this is my this is my reserve CC winner. It's uh, Ranchain Green Glow of Fenwood. A really really beautiful bitch, and I just love the style and the outline. And here she is together with the owners. It's Malcolm Godefroy and Anita Campion. So that okay. was a great moment for Craft 10 years ago. My research season One. winner. Wonderful. And then the uh, picture number seven is you showing um, somewhere. I don't know, but you will, you will tell us where and winning what. Uh, this, this is the picture. I will show it to you. Uh, okay, yes. Yeah. This is uh, Phil Stila at the World Show in Stockholm 2008 with Anne Woodcock okay. of the Central fame. <clears throat> this is how she looked when she was 10 years old, her last show, Best of Breed. So Wonderful. she was very special. And uh, that, was at the, that was her last show at this enormous entry. There were, there, were several, there were several judges, of course, because there was such a high entry. But the Best of Breed judge was Anne Woodcock. Wonderful. And then the last photo that we have is made at Cape of Good Hope where you are standing there and hoping that you will survive after the interview has finished. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And that's, that's Tell it. Tell us uh, about uh, that. Uh, I mean, that's the last photo. I mean, this is a photo that symbolizes how lucky I am and how fortunate I have been over the years to travel around the world, to see fantastic dogs, places. I made friends for life and how much this has enriched my life just yes, because I had my gold retriever pet 1968. It's, <laughs> taken me, it's taken me all over the world and I'm so 
proud and honored to have done that. And I thought, well, this is a different photo when we're standing at the Cape of Good Hope. And yeah. I, I really wish everybody a good hope for the future and that we're thrown back to a normal life again, because this is the hope that's yeah. the pandemic. We are all hoping for that, <laughs> really, <laughs> because I think we are sick and tired of sitting at home. Yeah. But okay. Um, okay, only two more questions are left uh, to finish this interview. Uh, uh, Hendrik, and uh, the, the penultimate question is, uh, what would be your advice for someone young who <laughs> wants to start with dogs and become successful, no matter as breeder, exhibitor or a judge? Okay. Um, first of all, read the standard. Read standard. Get a mentor. Study, learn, go to dog shows, talking to people, visiting breeders. Um, if you, let's say you're only interested in one breed, gold retrievers, for instance. Don't leave the dog show when the breed is finished. Look at the other breeds. Stay for the groups. Stay for the finals. Look at other breeds to, to broaden your horizon for dogs. Look and, and uh, try to learn as much as possible. <clears throat> and being a, a breeder is never easy. Um, you have to have green fingers, so, so to speak. You need to be talented. Um, Never give up, never give in for mediocrity. You need lady luck, of course. You have to be open-minded. I mean, there's so many things you have to consider. You have to be really determined, knowing what you do, what you want to do. And I think it's important that we, we actually help each other because we all want the same. And um, we, we have to respect each other because we can see beauty in a different way and there's nothing wrong with that that's that's good of course so that's that's for becoming a breeder and go to i mean if we now we're talking about gold retrievers go to england go to the uk go to the shows look study learn as much as possible talk to people get a mentor that is important and and if you want to start judging if that is a goal in your life, and if you're lucky enough to do that, again, have a mentor, someone you can talk to, study the pedigree, the dogs look as, as much as you can, the standards, more and more and more, and, and just, you have to be really interested, focused. Yeah. I think, I think that is a Absolutely. good advice. And we, we have, some, as you know, we have some fantastic young people um, well, in, in younger than me anyway, from the younger generation that are trying hard and they're very good uh, in my breed and in other breeds. Um, if I, <clears throat> sorry, I have to drink a little bit of water. If I can mention a few people that I admire from the younger generation. Absolutely. I have two very, very close and good friends in Sweden. That is Rika, who handles leading lady at Crafts, and it's Fanny Hellström, who's had many dogs for me, who also breeds mini Daxis. I mean, they are so talented, they have green fingers. They will go long in the dog world. Wonderful. And uh, if you go outside Sweden, uh, I must mention Giovanni Monteverdi in Italy. He's a young guy who is really doing his best. He's made up two English champions and dozens of Italian champions. He's so dedicated and knows exactly what he wants to do. And in the Netherlands, you have Gwen of the Petit and the Grand Basset, also the younger generation, very focused, very talented. I mean, I'm amazed by these young people who, who are so keen. I mean, many of us from the older generation, we, we had the chance to go to England, for instance, go to the UK, we worked many, many, possibly as kennel boys or kennel girls, went to the big kennels. We had the chance of learning, but there aren't so many big kennels any longer. Um, so it's maybe it's not so easy. But on the other side, it's easier to travel today 
than it was 40, 50 years ago. It's easy to travel yep. and uh, don't breed on internet, things like that, because yep. it's, you can see photos and you don't breed from a dog you've seen on the internet. You have to touch the dog, you have to know what it is. Well, that is my, that is my advice anyway. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, it's wonderful. I always like um, when when people, you know, who have made so much success um, can can appreciate younger people and and give them that kind of support. I know how much does it mean for them. So it's wonderful of you to mention a few of the young young people. I, I think that's definitely going to be a, a, a big thing for them. Uh, my last question for tonight for you, Hendrik, um, is uh, about the future of the sport. Um, a lot of things are happening uh, in every way, different things in different countries, different restrictions on breeding, showing, uh, grooming, all kinds of things. Um, how do you see the future of the sport? Let's say, um, what, what do you think it's going to be with purebred dogs and dog shows and, and dog breeding, let's say, in 10 years? I want to think that is going on in the right direction that we have dogs because we love dogs not because we want to win we have dogs because we love the dogs we love to rear litters seeing the puppies grow up we love our veterans we are so sad when we lose the veterans um, and i think we have to look after the breeds so they are not too <coughs> sorry so too commercialized or anything and I think that it's important that we have the dog shows, we have people we can talk to, and uh, <clears throat> and mentors. I think that is important. And hopefully the younger generation will be as dedicated as many of us have been to look after the, the, this wonderful sport, this wonderful world with dogs. I mean, there are so many of us who have such a fantastic life because of the dogs. Yes, Absolutely. we do other things in life as well, of course, but <laughs> having dogs, it makes you fit. You have to be out walking the dogs, you have to be able to pick up the poo, you do everything. Yes, it's fantastic to go to a dog show. It's even more fantastic if you win or if you're a judge. Yes, it's fantastic if you can judge beautiful dogs somewhere, but it's the love for the dogs that I hope will stay like that, that it's not just a, a commercial business. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, let me thank you, Hendrik, for accepting my invitation. Uh, let me thank you for uh, having an interview of almost two and a half hours uh, where we had all the time 300 uh, viewers watching it live. And obviously, there is going to be much more of them who will see this interview um, after after we finish. Um, we had 317 comments. Now oh, the wow. problem, yes. Now the problem with that is that to see these comments and to read all these comments, and there are, trust me, a lot of very nice um, comments. You will have to ask Sior to let you go into his Facebook, which I'm not <laughs> sure it's going to happen. But maybe in 15 or 20 days, uh, he will allow you to, to check. And uh, I'm sure that, uh, obviously, I didn't read uh, maybe 10, 20 comments. Uh, but there have been a lot of, a lot of wonderful comments, uh, many from the people that you know well, for your friends, uh, fellow breeders, fellow judges. And I'm sure that um, after we finish, in one of the next days, you will enjoy to pass through all these comments and read them uh, and you will be happy with the, with how this has gone. Um, let's just read a few of them. Verena is saying thank you so much for the fantastic interview. Um, Sinica saying thank you for this great interview. Uh, Colorado is saying thanks so much, really moving and uh, inspiration to all breeders and judges. Um, Manita is saying thank you, Hendrik and Ante, for a lovely evening. Bita Aren saying super interview. Thanks, Ante and Hendrik, really enjoyed this. Um, uh, Ulrika saying such a great evening with his fantastic uh, interview. Thank you so much. Roma saying thank you, Hendrik. It was interesting, full of knowledge. Uh, let me. The Jose saying great interview. Take care, all of you. Thank you so much. 
I mean, there are now hundreds and hundreds, well, not hundreds, but dozens um, uh, of, of people writing uh, uh, Thor Scar saying, thank you, Hendrik, for sharing great interview. A lot of people and obviously a lot of your friends are um, writing wonderful things about you. And, uh, well, some also a little bit about me because of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> but it was mostly for you, and I really, I really hope that uh, that you will be able to um, to pass through all the comments and uh, thank to some of the people who have write um, beautiful things about uh, you, your dogs, uh, your breeding, and uh, we have really enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, I must say that my guest next Wednesday is going to be uh, also a very famous judge. Um, and breeder Gabriel oh. Valdez from Colombia. Uh, he's breeding Italian greyhounds under Da Vinci's kennel, so I'm sure yeah, he, will, yeah. he will also be very popular. Um, last words of the interview, as usual, I leave Hendrik to you, so you can say a few words to our viewers uh, and say about your experience of tonight. Well, my experience of tonight has been interesting it's really going down the memory lane um and you put some really tricky questions which was nine i had to put my uh, thinking hat on um it's been really lovely and i'm happy about the number of people that took the interest and the time to watch this and to listen to uh, to us and i do think it's a brilliant idea that you have these uh, these interviews I, I really think so and I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, this is my life. Um, I w don't regret a single day. I have made so many friends all over the world that are the closest and best friends. Not only judges, breeders, puppy buyers that come very close to me. And it, it, it's uh, given me a wonderful life so far. And I hope it will continue more years. But you never know. You have to live yeah. one day yeah. at a time. Absolutely. So, so for me, this is a, a fantastic read, and I must say that I am very fortunate to to have a partner that shares my passion <laughs> for dogs. <laughs> of course, I know that lots of breeders, and active people, they don't have a partner that share the passion for dogs and the love for dogs. But I'm very spoiled by that. I mean, that that it gives a new dimension. To my dog world because I'm not alone. It's two of you. You discuss things, and you know when we look at puppies, I have one point of view and I get another point of view even if I don't want it, and we can <laughs> discuss what is the best, what is not the good. And I always discuss puppies with Ulrika and Fania, the two young girls, and because it, it gives a lot to me. It's um, I have, we are, we are, as I said before, we're a wonderful team and. Without the team, I wouldn't be where I am today. I can't emphasize that enough. Yeah. So it's been Wonderful. really lovely to share this. And um, thank you so much, Ante, for inviting me. I was really honored. Thank, thank you, Henrik, for being my guest. And I'm so happy that uh, so many people have liked it. You will see, uh, like in the last few minutes that you were talking, not only that you have uh, uh, saved your evening tonight, but also you have received like 20, 30, 40 comments of people just writing how wonderful the interview was. And uh, as I said, I'm sure that you will be happy to read all of, all of, all of these wonderful messages that are left for you. Uh, so enjoy that. Thank you once again for being my guest. Um, I hope that this crazy uh, pandemic is going to finish soon and that uh, uh, maybe we will meet, uh, we will meet soon somewhere and uh, you can bring me this uh, water from the fountain of youthless that you have <laughs> in, in your garden and, yes. and save save my life <laughs> or otherwise how many, I will how many stay. Bottles, how many bottles do you want? <laughs> well, I need I need to think if I want to get married or I want to get rich. It depends on all on many factors. But let's let's start with one for the moment. Anyhow, okay. Hendrik, That's thanks a, a lot That's for a everything. Promise. Yeah, thanks a lot for everything and uh, hope to see you soon somewhere. Uh, to all of you who were watching us uh, for two hours and a half, uh, all 300 and, and plus of you who left uh, 
till now. Let me see more than 370 comments. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for following this interview. Thank you for supporting this project. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, share my Wednesday evenings with all of you. Good night, everyone, and see you next Wednesday. Bye bye. Good night.